Welcome home. This is Katrina with Tampa Home Talk coming at you with a raspy voice this morning. I had a little too much to drink last night, uh, so my my voice has dropped several octaves. I'm joined with Leo Kane from Barrel Engineering. Welcome, Leo. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> No, morning. do you think anyone fell for it, Adam? I doubt that. Okay, I think well, our voices are pretty distinct. If they're one of our many, many listeners for the past ten years on the radio, so um, where is Katrina this morning? I have no idea. Not here. I know that. Not here. There so another cruise, possibly. I know she's got her uh, birthday cruise coming up in uh, November. It's November though. Yeah, maybe well, she's cruising from August to November. That'd be fun. Have you seen those where you're gone for like six months and you travel the world? Isn't that like a Viking River cruise? You like slowly make your way from... No, but those seem, although we would probably be the youngest on there by about 30 years, those seem like a lot of fun. They do. Each each room gets its own private butler and each room gets its own staff and you get all your meals cooked for you in your rooms. And I'm just making most of this stuff up. I actually don't know, but I've heard those, say, rumors, awesome, but heard those rumors. Sounds awesome. heard those rumors in like $10,000 a day. So Yeah, just give me a crappy pontoon boat. I'm just as happy. But speaking of numbers, why don't we uh, numbers, dive right yeah, in? Yeah, fire away. What you got? So what I've got here is a market that is kind of the stable, kind of the same. We definitely saw that shift. We definitely have our new listings at 844 which are going to be slightly higher than our pendings, which is 790. That's a good thing. Well, it, it means the market's turning back in the direction of that we don't want as professionals who want to see a lot of turnover. Right. Um, we want to see faster, looser market where there's lots of buyers, lots of sellers, and we're seeing more of a balanced market. Houses go on the market. They're, they stay on the market for several months. These listings that I'll announce during the last five minutes of the show – you might hear them week to week. I remember back in the day, this is like two years ago, uh, every week I would announce brand new listings. They'd be gone. They'd be gone. Do you, um, now on your side with the inspections, because you do a lot of new home inspections, right? So Correct. like if somebody goes under contract, they're calling you. Um, I have seen, now maybe it won't be reflective until next week. I do feel like past 10 days or so, I've seen a big uptick in far, as far as like, new purchase insurance quotes that I've been doing. So I've oh. seen a little bit of activity. Um, and I know some of my, my lenders have seen a little uptick too. Now, part of that could be the rate went down about a point, uh, or at least what they're offering, not necessarily what the Fed has. But. I don't think the Fed, their, their next potential downtick will be in September, which is interesting from an economic standpoint. Because I just had a session on economics. Um, <laughs> the Fed is either going to lower the rate in September or November next. So if they don't do it in September, they're almost guaranteed to do it in November. After either September or November, from that November time frame, the next two sessions after November, they're going to lower the rates. So what's interesting is we're either going to get four in a row or we're going to get three in a row. Right. And the, the whole September one is whether or not they want to meddle in the election. So is the world's strongest financial institution wanting to meddle in an election? It would seem to be... Probably. Yeah, so depending, so we'll see what happens with the rates in September. But what's interesting, in November, then February, then March, or February, then April, we're supposed to see three back-to-back -back rate decreases. So I'd love to see one in September. That means four rate decreases. I'm listing my own personal house in February, and that would time everything perfectly. Right. Now, when they're talking rate decreases, we're talking maybe like a quarter point or something, right? It's not going to be something drastic. It's something. I mean, you got to think we've been having Anything nothing. is better than nothing. We've had right? increases for the longest time. We've been holding steady a little bit. So, um, And the other thing I learned, which was interesting, is all these rate increases were supposed to curb spending. Well, the government started spending more money to make up for the fact there was less money in circulation. So they actually went against what the gar what the feds were trying to do. They were trying to remove money from circulation, so the government just tried to make up the difference. Love that for us. Love that. <laughs> and that that's a democratic uh, government, though. Like not, not democratic, like, oh, the power of the people voting, but the, the Democrats. They, they are big on government spending mm. um, for their programs, which trickle down to, oh, God, I sound like a Reagan economics. Uh, they, they, uh, <laughs> they, that money is supposed to trickle down into smaller <laughs> businesses, and other, but it ends up getting tied up in bureaucracy. Speaking of bureaucracy, I do have George Root with Stockholm Law Group, and we're going to talk about how the government continues to meddle in the condominium and homeowner association world in a second, but we still got to go back to these numbers. Okay. So what, what pops out to you? Um, new listings, 844, pendings and sold, neck and neck, 790, 795. 
So we still have more homes entering the market than we have leaving. That continues the trend. Uh, price decreases, 1509. We still have people trailing the market. So this is where having a good broker that's selling your home, like a Katrina, helps. Because if you list your home at the going rate six months ago, you're trailing it. You're always chasing it. Mm -hmm. And if you're chasing the bottom, you will, quote unquote, chase the bottom. I remember I had some bad real estate advice back in 2007. I was uh, had the ability to sell a condo that I owned down there. I bought it for like 30000 The condos were selling for like 115, 120 around that time. I wanted to sell, and the real estate agent's like, no, 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 hold on to it for a couple of years. It's 115 now. It'll be 160, 170 before you know it. Well, before I knew it, it was 20. Oh, boy. <laughs> and it still hasn't rebound, too, because it, in the area of Fort Myers, with all the hurricanes mm -hmm. and all the new construction because of all the rebuilding from all the hurricanes, it still hasn't rebounded to those rates. So I'm just holding on to it. In fact, uh, my insurance agent wants pictures of my Hurricane Ian repairs, which I'm working on getting. We do. Not me. I trust you. It's citizens, you know. No, I got to get it taken care of. It's got. <laughs> they want to see paint on the ceiling. I'll get paint on the ceiling. So, I mean, that's stuff to keep, keep in mind. If you're chasing the bottom, you're chasing the bottom. If you're constantly lowering your price slightly, you will constantly be lowering your price slightly. You've got to go down enough. I mean, I have another friend, and I kind of feel bad for his situation. Um, this is recent. He listed a condo for about nine ninety five before all of the Senate Bill 4D, 154, House Bill 1121, which you know a lot about, George. <laughs> before all that started <laughs> meddling with the condo industry, he had a buyer on the, that offered 900 and he turned it down because his real estate agent gave him bad advice. Got it listed for nine ninety five. We think this is fair. We think you can get this. Turned down the 900 offer. He turned it down. Senate Bill 4D came out, went into full effect. Two years later, still trying to sell. He now has an offer at 650, and he's Ooh. taking it. So Ooh. this is the Ouch. impact of bad real estate agents in chasing the bottom. You just can't do it. You need you need to forecast the future. You need to almost have a real estate agent that has their pulse in the economics, where the trends are, where the indicators are. Again, if we're right, we being those ec economics, not me. If they're right, and we have the rate decrease in September, which is followed immediately by one in November, which gets followed by one in February, that's the time you want to be listing properties to get more buyers on board. That's where you're going to see a jump in housing pricing. So first quarter to summer of tw I mean summer of 2025 is going to be the perfect time within this five-year period. We'll say the two years before and the three years next. The perfect time within the next five years is going to happen in summer of 2025 for buying and selling real estate. So if you're a seller and you can hold off until summer of 2025, you'll get your best rates. If you're a buyer and you can hold off until 2025 summer, you'll get your best rates. Now, that's not something everyone can do because you have to think someone's got to, buy, someone's got to live somewhere. I get yeah. a new job in Pinellas. I don't want to drive across to Howard Franklin every day. I'm not going to wait until summer of next year to buy real estate. So these are things that it, this helps the investors. This helps people who can wait. This helps the luxury move. This helps that whole trend we saw the peaking of the luxury during COVID. Everyone wanted a swimming pool in their backyard. That was a luxury purchase. The price of those skyrocketed. Those appraisals skyrocketed. We heard from people like Danielle Evans that the price constantly increased of your home just by having a pool. There are people who are buying new built homes, throwing a pool in the backyard and flipping it for twice the price they put the pool in. Those are smart moves. So I predict, based on the predictions handed to me, that summer of 2025 is going to be a raging hot market. Unfortunately, we're in summer of 2024 right now. <laughs> so that's the patience, prediction. Patience, patience, patience. patience. Do, would you also say too, especially kind of hitting back on the price decreases, like you mentioned be with a realtor that knows, you know, has their pulse on the, the market. Would you also say being realistic about what you can sell your house for is important as well? Because do you think it's all the realtors saying, hey, we should list it up here? Or do you think it's part of like the seller saying, well, my neighbor last year listed it at 550. Why can I not list it at 550? Right? Like hey, it's been another year. It should be worth more. But. That's the emotional aspect of buying and selling anything. If you think about it, Someone like myself, I'm looking at the numbers, I'm looking at economics, I'm right. looking at f trends and forecasts. That's very cold. Nerd. 
<laughs> yeah, go for it. That's I'm very just, cold. Kidding, but I'm if you think kidding. about it, it's an emotional purchase, buying or selling your home, how much mm-hmm. you think your home is worth. Like I, when I sold cars back in the day, We'd have people that sold cars back in the day. What 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 dealership? That was a Chrysler dealership. Oh, back boy. when Plymouth was still around. Oh boy, back, they didn't even make those. Anymore. Back when Plymouth and Suzuki were still around, Suzuki was selling us uh, like basically Jeeps. Yeah, uh, that's the. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, yeah. That, I remember that, the good date, times. That dates the the time. That's when the PT Cruiser was first coming out. Oh boy, it was a hearse on wheels. Everyone wanted one. <laughs> but again, using the PT Cruiser as an example. Um, we they they listed MSRP for like twenty one twenty two thousand. We were selling them at twenty six twenty seven. Mm-hmm. We were selling them five to six thousand over MSRP, and people were happy to pay it. It's an emotional purchase. It, once you put the emotion in these purchases, everything goes crazy. But the other aspect of the story is we'd have people come in and say, "Hey, I need to sell. I want to trade my car." And I'm like, "Great." And they're like, "Well, I owe fifteen. And we look up and like, "Well, your car is only worth twelve, mm-hmm. but I owe fifteen. Doesn't matter. Your car is only worth twelve. That's not our problem. Mm. Your car isn't worth what you think it's worth, and that's what we run into a lot with the real estate market. When the collapsed in 08, people were upside down. Now people are ahead. They've got all this equity, but now they're just greedy. Mm. We, I could sell my home. Theoretically, I could sell my home for five hundred thousand, and I can make two hundred thousand. But I, I can sell it for four hundred thousand and make a hundred. Which one am I, quote unquote, entitled to? And that's where the emotions come in. So people want the 500. Well, you're not going to get it. Or you're going to have to wait six months for it. Then they end up saying, well, I can't get the 500. I'll do 475. If you did 400 to start, you would have already had your house sold. And this Probably is where- at 425 because you would have listed low and you know somebody would have seen a good deal. Pretty much. And that's where a smart real estate agent who can help you get past the emotion is going to be crucial in these type of markets. And it doesn't matter if you're selling, like I said, a car and a lot, a business. I've seen this like 80% of all business broker transactions fall through because of emotion. Selling a home, it's a, these are all emotional purchases. It's not a black and white equation or a gray equation. And that's where you <laughs> that's where you need to separate and that's where you need guidance from professionals. So like now when you have these broker agreements, both the buyer and seller has one. I still don't know what the answer is there. If you're tying your commission to the sale price of a transaction, there's always that urge to get the best dollar possible. Like I'm hiring a broker and I'm paying them a commission of the sale of the property. But I'm also wanting them to get me the lowest possible price. That's in conflict with each other. And I don't think we have a solution to that. And having the broker agents, um, having those broker agents now have their own deals with the buyers individually, I don't think we get around that issue. In companies like, I think it was Redfin or Red Door or one of them that basically paid their people like Circuit City did. Remember Circuit City before it went out of business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they took away commission-based sales like Best Buy had at the time, like Radio Shack had at the time, and they switched to just hourly. Well, their sales tanked. Hmm. There was no incentive for anyone to actually sell stuff. It was a death knell. So you need commission-based greed sales. But if your agent has commission-based greed sales and it goes against why you're hiring them, get me the best property that I need for the cheapest price – there needs to be a different arrangement there. Mm. And if Katrina was here, she'd be strangling me right now. <laughs> well, she's not here to defend herself, so you're doing great. Well, she's a seller's agent, so in her defense, you know, should all work out. Um, do you think we'll see a lot of HELOCs come out, more pools coming with the rates going down, refis? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you got to think a lot of people are very cash rich in their home. If they've been in their home for any substantial period of time, they've got equity. And if they've got those lower rates, they're going to cling to them. So if you get a HELOC, you have to refi your current rate. Yeah. And that could cause a problem. If I have a 3% rate, I don't want to refi to get a swimming pool to get an 8% rate. Gotcha. Uh, 813-377-2775. That's 813-377-2775. You can call or text. We're here all day. Katrina list, but uh, call or text us. We're talking about condos, HOAs, all the fun stuff. 813-377-2775. We'll be right back after the break. Don't go anywhere. And welcome home. 
This is Tampa Home Talk. Uh, I'm Adam Talley with Talley Insurance. And before we dive into all the laws and everything governing uh, condos these days, we do need to have our insurance tip of the week. Um, and uh, for this week, I want to talk about flood insurance. Um, comes up quite a bit. Uh, I always see during this time of year, we get more and more people that um, they want to purchase flood, even if they're not in a, you know, a high risk flood zone. Right. So high risk flood zone, that's going to be anything that starts with an A as an Apple or V as in Victor. Um, if you're in one of those zones and you have a loan, they're going to require you to carry flood insurance. Uh, a lot of carriers, if you are in one of those zones, they're going to require that you carry flood as well. Right. Um, so just something to keep an eye out there for um, with flood. So if you have a, if you're closing on a loan and it's required, there is no waiting period. Okay, but if you want to get a flood policy and you're not in one of those zones or you're not, you know, closing on a, uh, a loan, um, there's a 30 day waiting period for the NFIP, right? So if you're worried about this, you know, there's some movement in the Atlantic right now. It's probably going to start heating up here in the next couple of weeks. I know Leo will want to talk about that because the dust is settling, right? Oh, we've got three active waves so formed right now. I'm, I'm very excited about the tropics this he, time of the year. It's the only time he smiles during this show. September to uh, end of October, October <laughs> is like my peak it's season. Prime, prime Leo season. Um, Anyways, uh, so if you're thinking about getting it, now's the time, right? Because if the storm's coming, you can't, you know, it's a 30-day wait on purpose. They do that so you don't buy it and then, uh, you know, right before the storm and you only got it because the storm is coming. We've had a couple of vicious rains. Now, like even Monday of this week, we had a vicious Monday downpour. Monday was tough, yeah. And Monday yeah. was real uh, tough. We do have some. So if you're in a, say you're in an X zone, right, which is a non-high-risk flood zone, we do have some private market carriers that are more competitive than the NFIP. They cover more, so they're even going to include maybe replacement cost on your contents. Uh, they'll include, you know, loss of use, which would cover for you to stay in a hotel while they're drying out your house, that kind of stuff. Um, and those only have a 10-day waiting period. And in some cases, we can do it next day, right? So if you're thinking, now is the time, right? Um, especially like Leo, or Leo said, er, earlier this week, we had some pretty big storms. If your street did not drain really quickly during those storms, it's something you might want to think about, right? Because if we get, was it Harvey that sat over Houston for five days? Oh, yeah. There was Har Harvey. Well, you think about Gene and Francis back in 2004 right, on where they just West Palm. Park. They, just, they just park. A desert can't handle five days of, you know, 10 inches of rain each day, right? Well, even, so. even what was it, Debbie we had recently? That one did a parking outside of South uh, Charleston. Right. Right. Yeah, so, basically, the, what, what happens with these parkings is that the storm turns. So the storm hits a current and the storm turns. So it's moving in one direction, we'll say northeast, and then it wants to move northwest. So while it's turning from the northeast to the northwest, it basically looks like it's parked. Right. Um, so in those situations, might not get the wind that you're thinking of, but you will get a lot of water. Um, and even if it's just from the street backing up into your front door, it's going to be flood and it's not covered under homeowner's insurance. So if you're curious, give us a call, 813-377-2775. Call or text flood and uh, we can help you out. And that's a it's real easy and quick to get done. Well, I have so. another solution. Uh -huh. You can move to the third to 12th floor of a building. You could. And the best person to help us learn about why you would or wouldn't want to do that would be George Root of the Stockholm Law Group. Thank you, Leo. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's interesting your conversation earlier about things impacting the market over the next couple of years. Uh, in particular, the condominium market, I think, is going to have some change. At the end of this year, it's the last time that condominium boards can less than fully fund their structural reserves in their building. Before this year, uh, members have always been able to vote to you know, not fund at all or less than fully fund. After this year, this is the last time that boards can pass a budget that less than fully fund structural components. And so right. starting in 2026, they'll have to fully fund structural components. So so structural components, can you explain that to people that you know are listening that might not know, right? They're not in the industry like you guys are. I'm assuming it's things like roofs, right? You gotta, gotta prep for your roof, what, every 20 years you gotta replace that, theoretically, or have the money for it? Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, this new bill that passed, the House Bill 1121, defines the useful life of several roofing components. Shingles at 15, um, all flats, even the ones that last 12 at 20, <laughs> and tile at 50. So they went ahead and defined all that in this bill. And I know citizens for a while have been trying to force a 10-year useful life on roofs. I think they got there because now they're doing non-renewals 
when your roof has less than five years of useful life and they got a bill passed saying there's 15 years of life left of life total on that roof mm. now real quick before we dive back into the condos with citizens let's say you get that letter that says we need proof whatever I've seen it where, and I ha- with the same client where it was like three years in a row, and we just kept sending in roof certifications, and each year it said five years. That right? works. So it works, right? It doesn't mean not doesn't necessarily mean you will have to replace your specific roof, um, but condos are a little bit different. So I well, before to we jump that. back right into condos, George, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the Stockholm Law Group? Yes. I think we skipped. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah why, the why we, intro. Part. Yeah, we skipped the why so we need to pay attention to you. House bills. <laughs> it's yeah. a. Uh, it, I think uh, our firm touches on everything we've sc- discussed here today. And by the way, they are very pleased with their utilization of barrel in a lot of their cases. The rest of my firm does first party property insurance dispute, and we've got a very robust flood pl- practice. I joined the group about four years ago to start the condo HOA uh, practice group, and we represent uh, condo boards all over Florida and HOA boards, uh, everything from collection to violation enforcement. I like to think of myself as a risk manager and kind of a coach teaching boards how to do the right thing. Okay. Cool. Yep. So you guys focus on first party property. You come aboard, you, you see the turn in the condo market. You probably came about right before Senate Bill 4D, 2022. This is uh, right after the Champlain Towers collapse and you see the potential for an upswing in condominiums needing legal advice. Absolutely. Um, and you, we talked about some of the legislative changes and, you know, when I tell people what I do, they're instantly angry at me a lot of times because the, I represent the man. But I think a lot of, especially on the HOA level to 720, the HOA changes, I think, are a little bit more unit owner friendly than they've been in the past. And a lot of people complain about violation enforcement and getting those nasty grams in the mail. But I think some of the legislative changes will be will, will help home, homeowners out a lot. So are you consulting the HOA boards? Absolutely. Okay. That's part of the job. I'm in-house counsel for about 130 condos and HOAs. Okay. So I'm their first line of defense. Um, not everything's within my ballywick, mm-hmm. but they come to me first, and then I point them in the right directions as far right. as getting the right Because trying to read through this is say, like, a you know, I live in a condo. I, I sell insurance. So, like, I'm not reading through all right. this. I so, feel a little lost in there. So Back to fines. I know that fine reform is always a problem. There are certain property management companies out there, one of which had a expose slandering it on a national news show Oof. about their levying of fines and the non-capping of fines. You'd end up with a $100 fine. It would compound $100 per day, and you'd be in a situation where you're, they could foreclose on your price because you owe thirty to $40,000 in fines. Now, I believe Florida passed something to prevent that. And let's distinguish between types of fines. You have HOA and condo fines, and you have local governments that fine you for code enforcement violations. Two different things. Right. They've been amending the HOA fining statute every year that I've been practicing. I've been doing this for 14 years, and it seems every year because it's uh, clear as mud. Uh, the mm-hmm. language is very ambiguous. It's but they've added some you. protections for homeowners this year. Now your violation, your finding notice has to say with specificity what the violation was, how you cure it, which covenant it's tied to, and they have to send the notice out between a 14 and 90 day window of the actual hearing. Uh, they've actually given homeowners more time to pay the fine too, and any violation that gets remedied before the finding hearing cannot be fined. And I, I understand the purpose behind finding is so that people don't have to f- spend money on attorneys like me to litigate violations, but it's wrought with potential uh, problems. Most yeah, of my problematic cases are finding cases. Like, like the HOA board is kind of like an abuse of power in that situation where they're over well, Sometimes that... it's the property management. So actually, the finding uh, committee is an independent body from the board. You have to appoint three folks, at least three folks, that are completely independent from the board. But live in the association. Absolutely. Oh, boy. So who wants to sign up for that, right? Karen does. <laughs> it's my job to get Karen in check and let her understand that, uh, you know, let's be fair and you have to live next to folks the rest of your life. So the aggressiveness of HOA. So, so it, it's amazing when you have, when you think about it for a second, you have like, you have, you have states and then you have cities and then you have you could have a community development district, which basically is a governmental body mm-hmm. that manages a bunch of HOAs. And an HOA basically is a small city. And they have rules that allows them to, they're elected officials that can lord Boo. over their area <laughs> and pass rules and regulations and laws. I mean, it's amazing the amount of power 
a board has without realizing it. One of the first things I do when I sit down and talk to a board during a reserve study session, I'm like, realize you are a officer of a multi-million dollar corporation. And it's like the look of like just disbelief passes over their face, but that's what they are. We're finally getting some legislative changes that are making these folks that are managing six, seven figure budgets get more education. So I think that was a really positive outcome of this legislative session. Good. So when we come back, I really want to take a deeper dive into the legislative changes. I okay. mean, the updates, the ones affecting the condominiums, the homeowner associations. If you're a board member, you definitely want to stick around. Really do a deep dive into what those changes are and those impacts. We all hear about dues going up, budgets going up. 813-377-2775. If you live in a condominium, 813-377-2775. We can be your lifeline. We being George, Adam, Leo, Katrina. 813-377-2775. Don't go anywhere. Smash like, smash subscribe. We'll be right back. Welcome home. This is Leo Kane with Barrel Engineering and Inspection. You are listening to the legislative of updates affecting HOAs and COAs in the area. Let's start with a softball question. How do I tell if I'm living in a co-op townhome or a condo it's not as softballish as you would think uh because a lot of townhomes kind of have more in common with a condominium than they do with an hoa because of the shared party walls and you've got multiple units in a building but they're actually organized under florida statute 720 which pertains to hoas generally an hoa is single family communities and condos are towers or two or three story buildings that have multiple units in a cluster if you right. will Okay, next softball question. <laughs> well, I have some. I, you, you throw, throw a softball I, out there. Well, I have something on this too. So, something that we come across, right? And I'm sure you've probably seen it on your end. Um, is somebody buys, say, a townhouse, right. right? And it the townhouse, you know, they are going to replace the roof when the time comes, but they don't actually have property insurance coverage for the building. And it confuses the clients because they're like, oh, no, they cover the outside walls and roof. And they don't, they're don't. they not really covering it. Like if lightning strikes tomorrow, they don't have any coverage. They're just prepping for it, you know, for that, that 20-year mark or whatever they're supposed to be doing. So um, do you see a lot of issues with that kind of on your end with insurance, like when things do happen? Absolutely. And not just the insurance aspect of it. Uh, the governing documents can be very different about in who's responsible for insuring which components versus who's responsible for maintaining, repairing, and replacing. Right. And if I can be quite blunt, I think a lot of the townhome maintenance obligations are drafted such to protect a developer from construction defect litigation. It doesn't make sense to put a building envelope on individual owners because one owner changing their one-eighth part of the envelope kills the structural integrity of that envelope. You need to replace the envelope or the roof for any of those right. parties. Well, I have a interesting case in front of me right now. I did the reserve study for it, and it's a tile roof, four units per, per unit, per, per building. No real separation on the roof line between whose tile, where it starts and stops, but you can't replace a tile roof in small chunks because of op the t most tiles are obsolete after like five or six years because they change the way the interlocks are and you end up in situations where unit owners have to pay like 30 grand to repair their roof when a whole roof replacement would be 20 grand because they're just doing sections mm. right it, it, it doesn't seem to make sense and it's tough to navigate some of these governing documents are quite ambiguous and they're not well written so a lot of times we're going there to amend them to make the maintenance obligations more clear you have 50-story tower condominiums around uh, the area and in Miami, and the window replacement maintenance repairs on the homeowners, and it's, it doesn't make logistical sense for a homeowner on the 50th floor to get a boom out there, a crane, to replace their three windows in their unit. Is that wow? I, w I wondered how those towers did that. I'm like, I know if you if it's on the it's near the slider, you can just do a swing lift or something like that. But yeah, a boom lift 50 stories up to replace three windows is going to be really expensive. Keep in mind, I'm from rural West Tennessee, and my dad's a subcontractor, so uh, I might not be using the right terminology for the equipment needed to replace a 50 floor window. But well, yeah, I mean, but if you're not if you're not doing it right off the sliders, I mean, it's 50 stories up, and there's no real access. That like like you have the the units that like wrap around the side of a building. How do you get to that window? 
And it's certainly more cost effective for an HOA to replace, say, 20, 30 windows and the shared cost rather than putting it on individual unit owners to be responsible for that. It, it just doesn't make logical sense. So what are some of the fun updates we're going to see? I mean, I heard there's one about like I don't know that I'd call portals. any of them fun. What about, the, what about, <laughs> what about the web portal? Well, they've uh, lowered the threshold. On the condominium side, if you had 150 units or more, you had to have a website. They've lowered that threshold to 25. And they've also finally added a website requirement on the HOA side. 100 or more units, you have to have a website of starting what in January. What functionalities 20. does the website have to have? Basically, just an owner portal where you can access the official records of the association. And that's one of the biggest overhauls to both the condo and HOA statute is the availability of official records and adding civil and criminal penalties for folks that uh, don't timely turn them over, destroy them, that kind of thing. So, and we kind of talked about this off air, but why would anybody want to be a part of a condo association board? It's a big ask. I am so thankful that people are willing to do it because it's a tough job. You're not supposed to get, be getting paid, although some people probably do. That's why we keep adding kickback language to the statute every year. Um, your homeowners get angry at you, but there are a lot of protections for the board members. There's director and officer insurance. The standard of care is that of an ordinarily prudent person. The statute doesn't say a sophisticated business person. Does it now, the DNO, is that a requirement by law? Obviously, we try to sell it anytime we get an opportunity because it is important. You wouldn't want that, but is it a requirement? I, I don't think so. I think you have DNO. to look at your individual governing documents. I think it's a good idea. I don't think there's a statutory a fool st- not push to have it. Right, right? absolutely. Like, I would, that's the first question I ask if you want me to be on the board. What kind of DNO coverage do we have? Yeah, because we were, as we, we were talking off air, and like, so. We're starting to see on our side, on the insurance side, where your umbrella questions, even seeing it on some of the homeowners' questions, because you have liability tied to that, where they're asking, okay, are you on a board, right? Are you on an association board? They even, one of them even asked, are you on a nonprofit board? Um, Because they want to make sure that, you know, whatever responsibilities you have aren't getting extended to the liability they're providing you. Absolutely. You know? Um, So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, not a fun time to be a condominium board. I mean, if, besides the pitchforks and the, we're seeing a lot of turnovers on boards. We're seeing a lot of turnovers on property managers. It's like the residents just simply don't understand why they've been living at a discounted rate at their condominium for the past 10 years. They now have to catch up and they have to catch up substantially with 60, 70% dues increases. Well, well, had, oh, most people, well I was just going to say like, so let's say you get a, an assessment for $10,000. What do you, most people don't have that just sitting around, you know, to write, stroke the check, right? So, like, how does that – obviously, people are getting foreclosed on in those situations. That's, are they forced to sell? Uh, they usually come to me to send the – to start the assessment lien foreclosure at some point. It's unfortunate, but uh, the changes and – the sins of past boards are going to force people out of the condo market because they just can't afford to pay the assessments. I had clients that passed twenty, thirty thousand dollars special assessments last year to make up for shortfalls in capital improvements that were needed. Any, any is there any exposure from the prior, you know, the past boards? decisions it's really tough because you're essentially suing yourself and it's so tough to pierce the corporate veil if you will like i said the standard mm-hmm. of care is an ordinarily prudent person they really have to be willfully negligent committing crimes stealing money for you really to go after someone successfully personally and do you want to put more good money after bad to pursue someone that may be judgment proof a lot of times you take your lumps and move on dang yeah i mean oftentimes when these these really long drawn out legal proceedings the only people that make the money are the lawyers so you're fighting your insurance companies. You're trying. Look at it. You look at no, it. I mean, pal. I mean <laughs> really, like you have a three or four year lawsuit, and there's insurance money on the table, and it's drawn out. And you're putting a lot of hours in. You're you're billing your time. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's where the money is going to go. It's to the lawyers to make the settlement or whatever transaction happens. Right. The board gets something. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they do get something after the legal proceedings, especially a foreclosure. They get a unit things of that nature. Right. I, that's one of the reasons I try to push the pre-suit alternative dispute resolution. You know, if a mediation is ex- successful, everyone walks away feeling a little icky, like they didn't get everything they wanted. Litigation, even if you have a really strong case, there's no guaranteed outcome. So I like to give my clients the worst case scenario and play devil's advocate. Mm. Let them know, I'm not going to gas up a client because these are clients I want to have for 20 or 30 years. Right. Sometimes with a unit owner or attorney, it's a one-off. So there's not the incentive to do right by them necessarily. I've got to have these guys as clients for 20, 30 years. So I want to save them costs, get them a good result and not bankrupt their coffers. So 
bringing us back to topic, what are your top three updates that I need to know? On the HOA side, it is going to get harder for HOAs to come after you for parking your work vehicle or commercial vehicle. Um, so that that's one thing. The other thing, um, talking about finding and violation letters, it's going to be virtually impossible for them to find you for leaving your trash at the curb. Good. That seems kind of silly. And it's dumb. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Oh, I got the city of Tampa. They gave me a letter. They, they actually didn't pick up the trash. I had called for, I gave them an extra fee to come pick up like bulk trash. They didn't pick it up, and code enforcement hits me with a letter, and then my fighting of code enforcement is like, here's your city that said they would pick it up and didn't. I mean, yeah, yeah trash at the curb is just, they're not in control. Of the, the homeowners aren't in control of that. They've also worked hard to eliminate art boards, HOA boards, from denying uh, improvement applications, f hiding behind some nebulous concept that it's not with the aesthetic appeal of the community. So you have to be able to point to a specific provision in your guidelines, rules, regs, to say that you're not allowed this type of improvement. Okay, that's on the HOA side. Now I'm going to hit the condo side. What's your top three? Condo side is probably just... Uh, like HOA, they're adding more board member education. So on both sides, previously, you could sign an, a piece of paper saying you agree to uphold the governing documents, or you could take a board certification course. Nobody took the board certification course. These folks are managing, you know, six, seven-figure budgets. Now they're required to take a four-hour robust condo HOA board cert course, and they're required to do continuing education unit every year that they're on the board. So that, I think that was much needed. And are these courses you have to take online, computer-based training, or can you have to be in person? What, what, how do I do this? It hasn't all shaken out. So they, they made this, uh, the statute effective July 1st, but they haven't fleshed out how we're supposed to do this. And the DBPR has historically been undermanned, underfunded. So they're still working out the kinks on how we push down the education and what courses. A lot of courses that I were previously approved for me to teach, I'm having to recertify and get them approved again. Nice. Awesome. Now, I don't really have too much to add to that. That's good. Co-ops and townhomes, top three. Top three townhomes. Well, townhomes fall in HOA. I don't do much co-op uh, work, so I'm going to stick with the HOAs. Uh, they're adding more penalties, civil and criminal, for board members that destroy official records, that... Uh, that uh, destroy balloting or voting records, uh, any forgery. Uh, there's more and more civil and criminal penalties added every year. They've also, you now you have to make a good faith effort to try to recover official records when you don't have them. You can't hide behind, well, the property management of old didn't turn it over to us, the old board didn't turn You have to make some good faith efforts to go and try to recreate those records. Like and certified just, letters and that kind of stuff to the property managers? or well, well, The way it works now, any homeowner can get official records by sending a uh, uh, records request letter, and we have 10 business days to get those to the owner. And now we have to add with that, instead of just throwing it all into a share drive, we have to have some type of organization and a checklist with it and... So if you want to be a thorn in the side of your HOA, a Karen. Start, start sending them It is wielded letters. as a weapon. That's why I try to get all my clients to let me draft records inspection policies to try to mm -hmm. still be transparent but curb some of the abusive nature of the requests. So if I'm a member of a community and my board isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing, they haven't created their web portal, I put my records request in, property manager is going telling me to do stuff that would make my Shriner have to hit the jump button. Um, where, what is my recourse? What, what, I mean, how do I, besides getting an attorney, what, what is my recourse as an individual homeowner? Like, let's say I'm trying to sell my unit and I can't get something simple like the records to sell my unit. What, what, what would I do? I would go to the Department of Business and Professional Regulation, file a complaint, send a records inspection request. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes you do have to go get an attorney and, and there's some very good ones out there representing unit owners. So Sign up for your listings. Oh, that's that, that, up next. I can't believe we're almost at the top of the hour. for the listings. Top of the bottom. Bottom of the hour. Bottom of the hour. Bottom of the hour. And I'm so looking forward to talking about the listings. I've got four beautiful listings. We will wrap up with, oh, thank you, 30 seconds. We will wrap up with George when we come back from the Stockholm Law Group. And if you have any, if you are a condo board member, 813-377-2775. That's 813-377-2775. We can get you hooked up with George for your condominium lawyer, questions we can get you hooked up with adam for your insurance questions or we can get you hooked up with leo for your structural integrity reserve studies and milestone inspection questions we'll be right back don't go anywhere welcome home this is leo came with barrel engineering and inspection we've had a lively hour very lively hour you know i learned something the other day what to learn um, i discovered that soy milk is actually real milk 
Okay. It's just announcing who it is in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to work on you. Well, thank you. I, I, I had no real way to fit that in. I really <laughs> wanted to fit that in, but there was no way I was going to fit a milk joke Big in wind up. To a, Big to, wind to, up to, a, to a lawyer show. I should have looked up some lawyer jokes, come to think of it. What's the difference between an attorney and an accountant? Ooh, ow. The accountant knows he's not funny. <laughs> True, <laughs> true. I guess that could be with the engineer too. We know oh, enough. You guys are we a lively, over analytical bunch. <laughs> <sighs> so it's been great having you on the show, George. Um, Thank you. Learned a lot. Um, Stockham Law Group can handle a lot of your clients' needs. Um, this HOA world's just getting more and more interesting as the state is giving more and more power to the building departments and the DBPR to meddle in the arena so it's important that if you are a board member that you have representation that you have someone you can lean on i don't know how many times i've been asked as a reserve specialist um questions that i'm like well that's got to go to an attorney they're like why can't you answer it i'm like i'm not an attorney right um it's just it's amazing when you get all these new so how does that work you got a new bill goes into effect it's nebulous no one really knows how to interpret it i even get attorneys that won't even give opinions on it so so how do the attorneys get to the point where they can actually make an opinion on a bill that just went into effect? That the DBPR is now muddled up with some documents that are conflict with the bill that's saying that these are now associated with it. Well, the fact that they amend the finding statute 72305 every single session lets you know that there's it's not perfect. You know, we have human beings drafting these things. And and one other wrinkle I'd like to add that to that is there's a 1970s Supreme Court case called Kaufman, and it stands for the proposition that the set of statutes in place at the time your association was founded are the ones that apply to you. So there's an argument that some of these legislative changes may not apply to your condo or HOA unless there's clear legislative intent that they be re retrospective rather than prospective. So that's an analysis. But I try to carve a path with the clients. Let's take the conservative approach. Let's make sure we follow the governing documents, the statute, and we'll be safe that way. So it's funny you should mention the Kaufman case. I remember when Senate Bill 4D first came out. Now we're back in Structural Integrity Reserve Study Land. Um, we're going to talk about doors and windows. Um, Senate Bill 4D tried to make doors and windows the responsibility of the HOA. And attorney after attorney after attorney kept mentioning the Kaufman language. So that's, that's pretty interesting. You're even mentioning that now. So can you tell us a little bit about the Kaufman language? Because I think it is really relevant to a lot of boards out there. So the language essentially is it'll say something either in an individual covenant or at the beginning or the end of the declaration that submits that covenant or that declaration to statutory changes. And uh, it, it's usually worded something as the statute's amended from time to time. You see that kind of magic language. So you really have to look at your governing documents with your uh, general counsel to see if you have that Kaufman language and also whether you want to amend your governing documents to add them. Arguably, I would think if you amend, let's say, one of, the, one of the big changes this session was the commercial vehicle bans. Virtually impossible to go after those commercial trucks now. So under the Kaufman theory, if your governing documents have a commercial vehicle ban, you can still pursue that violation. However, if you go in and tweak and amend that individual provision, does it now open us up to the statutory change? Are we even allowed to change it now? So there's all kinds of Kaufman analysis you have to think about with your counsel. How often should these HOA boards be reviewing their governing documents? I'm assuming we're talking bylaws and that kind weekly, of stuff, right? Weekly, weekly. <laughs> well, I don't think you want to amend your governing doc documents to chase the statute because the statutes are changing every year. Right. And, you Constantly know, if it's chasing like, your tail. Right. It, if it's not popular, it could get knocked out next year. So I think you ought to take a really conservative approach, sit down. What can we live with in our docs? What absolutely has to go? Listings, bud. Yeah, it's time to do the. Uh, <laughs> George, I'm, I'm losing my voice George, thinking about a, all these awesome listings. Pleasure having you on the show, it's George. Yes, Lee with the Stockholm Law coming. Group. Thank you very much for coming. We're about to do the Barrel Project Engineer sponsored announcement of. No, there's no open houses, so we're just, no open houses. It's just, just listings, just homes for people to to buy. Does that mean the Tally Insurance isn't sponsoring the Barrel oh, Project I'm Engineering? Sponsor, I sponsor all Barrel Engineering announcements. Okay, and I will sponsor this this announcement of these four listings. Now, remember, the listings here do not represent the views or opinions of the show as a whole. These listings are just merely the opinions of Katrina on what she feels she could sell these houses for. These are great opportunities. These are great opportunities, but they in no way, no way reflect the opinions of Barrel Project Engineering or Italian Insurance or Stockholm Law. Love it.
Did I do that disclaimer after? You did great. I think I, a, thank a, you. a disclaimer is good. I, I just want to appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. Disclaimer. I figured with the lawyer in the house, the yeah. disclaimer would fit. Second, love that was That was the second dad joke, by the way. So we've got 19211 Pelican Ridge Lane, uh, Tampa, Florida, 33647. This is a 2004 build, four bedrooms, three bathrooms, 575000 um, Seems like a good price. This is Welcome to Paradise Living at its finest. It's nestled within the amazing West Meadows greater community of the preserve. It's a stunning four-bedroom, three-bathroom home with a den. <laughs> now we have 14626 Red Castle Ave in Lithia. It's a, a rental. This rental is a rental. This is a rental opportunity. If you want to rent for a little bit, wait for those rates to come down in a year. I think this could be year. a solid play. We're finally in a, in a time frame where it's actually better to be renting than buying a house. That will change. But for right now, we're in that sweet spot where it's better to lock in a rent than it is to buy. So for $4,000, you can get a five-bedroom, four-bathroom house. And that is amazing for a family that would want to live in Lithia. Yeah. I'm just imagining price. kids everywhere. Yeah. Also, we have one, 8887 Little Blue Stem Drive. Mm -hmm. I pronounced it correctly, Chris. Blue blue Stem. No, no, (laughs) Blue Stem. Yeah. Little Blue Stem. This is listed for rent at $3,500 per month. Or for sale at just a shade under $600. It's a 2023 build. It's got a pool, listed lowest priced pool home in Connerton. Buy now, no wait. And we talked about pools earlier and the magic and the importance of having a pool. This is a great five bedrooms, two and a half bathrooms. You can rent this beauty for $3,500 a month. And I think that would be a solid play. Take advantage of the situation. Live in this property for the rental. And last, I have 19445 Sunset Bay Drive in Land Lakes, Florida. This is a beautiful four bedrooms, two and a half bath. It's got one of the longest garages, uh, longest driveways I've seen in a while. It's one of the <laughs> largest lots in Lakeshore Ranch. It's on one third of an acre. Well, that long driveway. It's one of my clients, Lakeshore Ranch. Lakeshore yeah. Ranch. Oh, there we go. We know they're. Then we know they're. Uh, we know they're taking care. Managed well. There's a large green lanai, freshly painted, open floor plan, 0.31 of an acre. If you want land, if you want space, this house is for you. 19445 Sunset Bay Drive, 475,000. Those what are. A steal. Our, those are our listings. For that or any more information, 813-377-2775. That's 813-377-2775. We'll be happy to hook you up with a listing, tell you about an open house. Open houses resume next week. Hook you up with George for condominiums. Hook you up with Adam for insurance. Hook you up with Leo for engineering, inspection, or reserve studies. It's been a blast. Katrina, we hope you stay away more because we had a lot of fun when you were in here. We got the important news out to our listeners. And it... You don't love where you live. Someone in this room is going to fix it. See you later.